What is up, you guys? So welcome to this series entitled Machine Learning with TensorFlow and Scikit-Learn. Now, Gradient Descent is a very generic optimization algorithm capable of finding optimal solutions to a wide range of problems. The general idea of Gradient Descent is to tweak parameters iteratively in order to minimize a cost function. Now, suppose you are lost in the mountains in a dense fog. You can only feel the slope of the ground below your feet. A good strategy to get to the bottom of the valley quickly is to go downhill in the direction of the steepest slope. This is exactly what gradient descent does. It measures the local gradient of the error function with regards to the parameter vector theta, and it goes in the direction of descending gradient. Once the gradient is zero, you have reached the minimum, right? To be more concrete, you start by filling theta with random values. This is called random initialization. And then you improve it gradually. Taking one baby step at a time, each step attempting to decrease the loss or cost function, as you can see here. You keep doing so until the algorithm converges to a minimum. Now, an important parameter in gradient descent is the size of the steps, determined by the learning rate hyperparameter. If the learning rate is too small, then the algorithm will have to go through many iterations to converge which will take more time, right? So if we start by a certain random point and then mu is really small, as you can see, we need many iterations to converge to the minimum, right? Now, on the other hand, if the learning rate is too high, you might jump across the valley and then end up on the other side, possibly even higher up than where you first started. Mathematically speaking, the algorithm diverges with larger and larger values failing to find a good solution. Now, unlike the MSE cost function, which looks like a regular bowl, there are cost functions that may contain holes, ridges, or even plateaus, right? Which makes conversions to the minimum very challenging. Now, as you can see over here, we've got two main challenges with gradient descent. If the random initialization starts the algorithm on the left, then it will converge to a local minimum, which is not good because we can do better. There's the global minimum and its neighborhood, which does way better. However, if it starts on the right, then it will take a very long time to cross the plateau. And if you stop too early, you will never reach the global minimum. Now, unlike this cost function, the MSE cost for linear regression models happens to be a convex function. That is, if you pick any two points on the curve, then the line joining these two points upper bounds the curve. That is, it's always on top of the curve. And this is true for any two points on the curve, right? Now, having it being convex, there are no local minima and just one global minimum. It is also a continuous function with a slope that never changes abruptly. Mathematically speaking, its derivative is not only continuous, but Lipschitz continuous. Combining these two facts, we get a very great consequence. Gradient descent is almost guaranteed to approach arbitrarily close to the global minimum. As a matter of fact, in higher dimensions, so what we had previously is the MSE cost for linear regression models given only one theta, that is, we're trying to estimate only one model parameter. Now, imagine we've got two features, that is, we've got two model parameters to estimate, theta one and theta two. Thus, the MSE cost function would have the shape of a bowl as such, where red is minimum, orange is greater than red, and so on. So this is a color map. The further to the right you go, the larger the cost is. So the minimum is found in this red dot, right? Corresponding to theta one min and 
32 min, right? Now, if the features have equal scales, then you get this nice looking regular bowl, right? However, it may sometimes turn out to be an elongated bowl, which happens when the features have very different scales. Now, if you run gradient descent over here on a training set where features one and two have almost the same scale, then the behavior happens as such. The convergence starts out, let's say you randomize over here, and then you start going downwards, right? So you will converge linearly as such. However, if feature one has a smaller value than feature two, then your convergence, let's say you start over here, your convergence will not look linear. It's going to, you know, it might deviate around the straight line, which means that it will take it more time to converge, right? Now, since feature one is smaller, it takes a larger change in theta one to affect the cost function, which explains why the bowl is elongated along the theta one axis, as you can see over here. Now, back to the convergence behavior over here, we see that it, you know, runs to the minimum on a straight line, right? Which means that it reaches it quickly Whereas in the case of the elongated bowl or features with very different scales, it goes in a direction almost orthogonal to the direction of the global minimum, which is not good. You're doing the worst possible, right? In the extreme case, when you're orthogonal, that's the worst case. <laughs> Because in that case, you will never, ever converge. And then after, you know, taking this almost orthogonal direction, it ends with a long march down an almost flat valley. It will eventually reach the minimum, as you see, but it will take a long time. Now, whether we're dealing with a nice looking bowl cost function or an elongated one, this illustration should show you that training a model is the equivalent of searching for a combination of model parameters that minimizes a cost function. It is a search in the model's parameters space. The more parameters a model has, the more dimensions this space has, and the harder the search becomes. So searching for a needle in a 300 dimensional haystack is much trickier than in three dimensions. Fortunately, since the cost function is convex, in the case of linear regression, the needle is simply at the bottom of the bowl. So to implement gradient descent, you need to compute the gradient of the cost function as we saw with regards to each model parameter theta j. In other words, you need to calculate how much the cost function will change if you change theta j just a bit. And this is actually captured by the partial derivative of the cost function we're trying to minimize. So we know that gradient descent updates the estimates as follows, right, where mu is the learning rate and nabla sub theta is the gradient of vector f. Now, since f has to deal with vector quantities and theta is a vector, then that's why it's a nabla. A nabla is defined as the vector containing all the partial derivative function f of theta with respect theta j, right? Of course, in that case, theta would contain all the quantities theta zero, theta one, down to theta. Now, we're going to see how batch gradient descent functions when the function we're minimizing is actually the MSE, and in particular, the MSE for linear regression. That is, so my f of theta is actually the MSE, right? So we're minimizing this mean square error. It will turn out to be useful to express this guy summation using vector quantities. That is, you can easily verify that this guy is actually y minus x theta transpose y minus f theta, right? where x and y's are defined as follows. We talked about those in the previous lecture. And even more, you can define it in terms of the Frobenius norm, the L2 norm, y minus x. So why is this important? Because it turns out to be convenient to compute gradient. This case, gradient will be, I'm not going to go into, this is vector calculus, I'm not going to go into how to compute the partial derivative of this, but you can use chain rule for vector quantities. That is, you'll get one over M, then you're deriving this quantity with respect to theta, vector theta, then you'll get a two, and the derivative of Y minus X theta with respect to theta 
is actually trans then you're left with this quantity actually it's minus x transpose but inserting the minus inside so inside instead of writing y minus x theta i'll write x theta minus y so this guy is a gradient of the mse cost function and hence gradient batch gradient descent applied on the mse cost function would give you so if i plug if i plug this guy gradient of gradient descent step i'll get this equation so as you can see oh, and by the way this is theta n right given x given y right and a certain initialization point of theta so theta superscript zero i could run this algorithm over as many iterations as i'd like of course given a certain learning rate right so what's going on here it's like you're trying to figure out the slope of the mountain under the feet if i face let's say east right and then asking the same question facing north and so on now you may be wondering why this method is referred to as batch right this is because the formula you see over here involves calculations over the full training set at, at each gradient descent step it uses the whole batch of training data at every step right and hence as a result it will be slow given large training set however gradient descent scales well with a number of features right so training a linear regression model when there's hundreds of thousands of features is much faster using gradient descent than using the normal equations right so once you have the gradient vector over here in white this gradient vector is actually pointing uphill so since we've got a minus means that you go in the opposite direction that is you go downhill now the speed of this descending depends on mu not only depends on the gradient but also depends on mu it's actually telling you the downhill step size right now let's see how we can implement this on python so let's define our learning rate i don't know why but i keep referring to the learning rate as mu that's not correct this is a greek alphabet that stands for eta sorry about that anyways let's define an eta to be 0.1 and let's limit our number of iterations to be a thousand also let's pick a hundred features right so number of feature points right so now let's initialize theta randomly that is the instance of a standard normal distribution so this is the initial point and now let's run the iterations right so for iteration in range of iterations first compute the grad or the gradient that is this term over here right so two over m right x b transpose multiplied x b x b times theta minus y right and then after we have this chunk go ahead and update as such so my new theta is my old theta minus eta times gradient right now let's take a look at theta over here and there you go 4.59 2.9 this is exactly what the normal equation found right there you go 4.59 2.93 which means that gradient descent in this particular example worked perfectly but what if we had to use a different learning rate so let's create a function here that plots how the linear regression line would look like for different values of eta. So let's first define a function called dot gradient descent that takes in a initial value of theta, the eta. So first let's extract length of my xb. Next let's plot the training set then let's set a number of iterations as we did previously to a thousand and loop over those iterations so for a particular given theta i'm going to perform prediction on theta at this given iteration and i will save it in y predict and let me set the style of my line which is blue if iteration is positive else it's red then i'll plot my predicted y using the theta at iteration n with the given style right either red or blue so the thing is i'll only do this for 
the first 10 iterations so for iteration less than 10 i don't want to do it a thousand times okay really if you do it a thousand times that sets up your plot so what i mean to say is that we're only going to plot the first 10 times right okay and the red dashed line is really the first iteration whereas the second third until the tenth will be plotted in blue okay so now let's compute the gradients for the update, which is exactly the same as before. So I'll copy paste. Likewise, the theta update is also as before. So I'll copy paste it from here. Nothing has changed, right? And, and there you go. So now we can plot. So plot the X label, the X axis, I'll label it as X one. I'll set a font size to 18, right? And give a title right now. Let's plot. So let's start with a given theta random. Actually it's random from it's picked from a, it's a single sample from the standard normal distribution. Now I need a figure. Let's set the dimensions. Okay. Now, on the first subplot, I would want to run the function I wrote given theta and enter equal 0.02. There's an error saying plot is not defined. Well, where's that error? Oh yeah, it's over here. So it's PLT. Sorry about that. And there you go. So this red line is the first iteration given an eta equal 0.02. And then as you could see with number of iterations, the straight line is increasing to be to align with the data points, right? Now, let me set a seed over here so that I reproduce the same um, figures, even if I ran this block multiple times, okay? Set a seed over here, a seed of 40, Say a seed of 66, right? Now on the second subplot, actually let's take advantage over here and label the y axis as y right and let me rotate it zero it's font size font size 18 okay good now i'm going to do the same thing but for eta equal point 0.1 okay point 0.1 second subplot there you go let's repeat this one more time for eta equal point 0.5 okay looks good now what we can see over here from this gradient descent at different learning rates is that once we start with a small eta, the algorithm will eventually reach the solution, but you know, it will take a long, long time. So let me show you what I mean. Um, let's, let's even plot this for a hundred, the first hundred iterations. Okay. As you can see, there you go. So it took it, I don't know, like one, two, three, four, five. I'm not going to count those, but it's, it's a lot. So, so you can see that it took it many iterations to reach the desired linear fit, right? Now, when eta is 0.1, the learning rate looks pretty good to me. I mean, it took it like one, two, three, four, five, almost six iterations to reach the same accuracy of that of when eta was 0.02 after many iterations. Just after six iterations, it has already converged to the solution. Now, when eta is high, like 0.5, the algorithm diverges. It jumps all over the place. You can see, look at those values, 40,000. I mean, the straight line, it doesn't, the training set even doesn't show anymore. Actually, the red line even doesn't show, right? Um, and even more than that, you could see that it's jumping above and also below training set, which is totally not good which means that the algorithm is divergent. So instead of getting close to the line, you're getting away. You're going away from the line. Actually, to find a good learning rate at the, you can use a grid search. However, you may want to limit the number of iterations so that grid search can eliminate models that may take too long to convert. Now, you may also be wondering, how do I set the number of iterations right here? What if I set it too low, too high? Uh, what is it? If it's too low, you will still be far away from the optimal solution. Of course, I mean, imagine if I ran for 0.02, I ran it like four times. I'll be over here, right? So, which is not even close. However, if it's too high, you will just, you know, waste a lot of time like here and point one, I mean, everything after six is actually pretty good, right? So what you're doing after is just a waste of 
time and resource and each iteration will barely change theta if not keeping it the same so a simple solution is to set a very large number of iterations like a thousand or ten thousand but to interrupt the algorithm when the gradient vector becomes tiny that is when its norm becomes smaller than a tiny number say epsilon which is referred to as precision so that is you can you know find an epsilon over here actually let's pass an epsilon right here so epsilon and let's set the default value to zero which means as if it doesn't exist right so the default value is zero and right so over here before i do the update let's say if mp.linalg.norm right of theta minus okay so at each iteration we're updating theta by this quantity right now the question is when does this guy become bounded in norm so when does this guy become less than epsilon? so if that's the case just break okay so running this nothing will change because epsilon is zero however we go ahead and you know so i'll just focus on the first plot actually i'll just focus on the second plot no <laughs> Actually, what I'm going to do over here is just print a message. It took me that much time to finish. Actually, that much iteration. Right? So if I run this, I should be able to see 999 because I still didn't specify. We have to add one so that we get a thousand. Okay, so the three algorithms, it took them a thousand iterations. Now let's specify here uh, epsilon one it just, it just did one iteration because after one this guy is always upper bounded by epsilon so let's decrease the one to point one and as you can see 18 iterations and it stopped now the epsilon is not too good over here however if you do this for second learning rate you see it took it seven iterations and then it stopped because it found that with epsilon precision I'm going to break this loop so at the gradient so that means the difference between that means that this difference right is lower bounded by epsilon right so the less this guy is the more iterations you will find right so 0 0.001 i just need 63 iterations to finish 0 0.001 i need 131 right and as this decreases the number of iterations will increase now what's really interesting here to notice is that with 10 to power minus 5 precision you need 198 iterations which is pretty good so point 0.1 is a really good learning rate for this given data now it's worth noting here some stuff regarding the convergence rate so in other words how how fast are you converging now when the cost function is convex the mse is convex in 1d or even in 2d or n dimensions right the mse is always convex and also given one more condition that its slope is lipschitz continuous it can be shown that the batch gradient descent with a fixed learning rate fix at the because also there's other variations of gradient descent where at the varies with iteration so you'd have an eta sub n but if you fix eta and you apply gradient descent for the mse cost or even any convex cost that is lipschitz continuous then batch gradient descent has a convergence rate of o of one over number of iteration in other words if you divide the tolerance epsilon right here by let's say 10 to have a more precision then the algorithm will have to run about 10 more times right so let's repeat this over here so i was doing this but i didn't note it to you so again if i run with one now focus on the second line right here okay actually let me put a print enable so default value is one over here if print enable is one then print why am i doing this because i don't want the print messages for the first nor third gradient descent so run this there you go so for point one it took me seven iterations now if i divide this guy by 10 and i should be able to see two digits right if i divide by 100 almost three digits or there you go five and you get the idea so thanks for watching if you enjoyed this lecture please consider subscribing to my channel liking this video sharing it on social media and if you have any questions whatsoever just leave a comment down in the comment section below i'll make sure i'll get to it as soon as possible